on uh, critically important uh, on actually antimicrobial resistance. And uh, as part of that, one of the biggest issues that we identified is that can, you know, we need to talk about how we can reduce antimicrobial resistance and the two pathways of animals as well as environment. But within that, one of the things that gave us huge or gives us huge concern is that there is a group of antimicrobials, which, um, which across the world has been agreed that these are critically important for human health. These are kind of what you would call the last resort medicines, what you do not want to play around with. So how do you make sure that you have a policy for these and a practice for them so that you can conserve them, you can preserve them? It's kind of like as environmentalists, we talk about the biodiversity and the development agenda. We talk about how we are talking about protection and conservation on one hand, and we are talking about development and growth on the other hand. Think of it in that terms when you look at the, the, the issue of critically important antimicrobials. And we know that these are being used in animals. Some of it is necessary because animals require um, disease management as well, but how much which ones do we have a clear list that we will say these will definitely not get used at any time? Or do we have a list that says that these can be used, but with minimal at the, as, as the last resort? Or what do we do? And that's really something that uh, my colleagues uh, at CSC um, have been working on and have come up with a report which... Uh, which looks at some of these issues in great depth. And we want to discuss that today. We want to discuss it today with an amazing group of panelists who I will introduce right now, and then I will open it up. Uh, then I will ask my colleague uh, Amit Kurana to give the presentation on the CSE findings on conserving the use of critically important antimicrobials in food producing animals. So the panelists that who will be joining us, uh, who have joined us are Peter Bayer. Uh, Peter is the unit head of the AMR Global Coordination Department at the WHO, the World Health Organization. So the, the organization which is, which is deeply concerned at the overuse and the misuse of antimicrobials in what is today being seen as the silent pandemic. Junsia Song, is the Senior Animal Health Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Again, FAO is a very, very important UN organization helping to guide and steer the world uh, in terms of sustainable food production. Where in, in a world where we know we need increase in productivity, but we need it not at the cost of environment and human health. And that's really where uh, Junsia will help to explain to us what are their perspectives on this. Olafur Valsen um, is, is the AMR liaison officer um, the, um, in the antimicrobial resistance and veterinary products department of the World Organization for Animal Health. So this is the global organization, absolutely the global organization, which looks at the question of animal health. And we're really delighted that Olafur found the time to join us because his view and his work on this is going to be very important as we move along. We then have uh, um, Scott Wies. Uh, Scott is a professor at the Ontario, uh, Ontario uh, Veterinary College and director of the Center for Public Health and Zoonosis um, in Canada. Um, Scott and I are both members of the Global Leaders Group, uh, which has been set up to look at antimicrobial um, resistance at the global level and to guide and to help to bring out this issue at, um, at different forums. So he and I are colleagues as well, and I'm very grateful that he joined us. He has just helped GLG to come up with a position paper 
on the issue of, um, of uh, food and antimicrobial resistance. So uh, very grateful that he could help us. Uh, he will be with us. So let me ask uh, with this, we have, as I, we have an amazing group of people, the right people. It's not just amazing, but the right people. And so I want to kickstart this right away and get Amit to begin with his presentation. And then I will start a panel discussion where I will invite everyone to speak. Amit. I just share the screen. Yes. And uh, is, it, is it visible? Yes, it is. But can you make it full uh, screen, please? Yes, perfect. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, based on where you all are uh, uh, sitting right now. So <clears throat> why this Why this book? Why this report? Uh, one reason, one, one major reason is, of course, that we've been working in India and also working, interacting with other parts of the, of the, of the world, for example, countries in Africa and Asia. And what was very clear was that over the last several years, things were not moving in terms of how they should when it comes to how to, uh, how to, how to avoid the misuse or let's say how to avoid the overuse of critically important antimicrobials. And one of the reasons which was typically cited was that uh, this, that we are following a guidance and that guidance is coming from one or the other agency. Um, uh, I mean, in our interaction from the animal health folks, in our interaction from the human health folks, I mean, both different uh, sectors used to refer to different kind of, I mean, the guidance which they got from their uh, headquarters, for example, the health sector folks refer to the WHO guidance. In fact, the animal sector folks typically refer to the FAO as well as the OIE uh, guidance. And, and we could clearly see that one of the reasons why things were not moving as they would, they should is, is the fact that how, what is the guidance? What is the global guidance? So this report also talk, uh, talks about, apart from the guidance part, also talks about how the how the situation is in India, and that essentially is also linked. It in a way reflects how the guidance, the impact of guidance that that would have had on a particular country. But today we will only be talking about the first part of the report, which is about gaps and possibilities uh, in the global guidance. So, uh, but why? I mean, so clearly we can see that there's this growing need to conserve the use of critically important antimicrobials, and that's essentially because we can see the resistance is, is increasing against critically important antimicrobials. The recent glass report, uh, the latest one on 2020, 2027 clearly tells us, you can see the bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections, gastrointestinal infections, uh, genital infections. In all these cases, the key bacteria which cause uh, the diseases are getting resistant to, to to many antibiotics, and, and those antibiotics are essentially the critical important antibiotics. Uh, you can also see on the right-hand side uh, that there's this uh, WHO's Global Tuberculosis Report, which basically says more than 0.5 million uh, people developed the vampirocin resistance tuberculosis in 2019, and of which were 78% were multi-drug resistant. So clearly resistance against critically important uh, antimicrobials is a big issue. It is, it is very clear. Uh, let's now try and understand what, what are these critically important uh, antimicrobials. Uh, and there's this WHO list of 2018, which basically is developed uh, after having recognized the importance to the human medicine. And, uh, and essentially they have ranked uh, the medically important antimicrobials for risk management of uh, antimicrobial resistance due to non-human use of antimicrobials. Uh, all medically important antimicrobials are are divided into critically uh, important or highly important and then important and critically important ones are further divided into based on uh, uh, prioritization factors into highest priority critically important antimicrobials. But important thing that I want to highlight here is that is the definition or let's say the, the criteria which you see that a critically important antimicrobial is a sole or one of the limited available therapies to treat serious bacterial infections uh, in humans and are used to treat bacterial infections transmitted from non-human sources. Clearly, you can see that the, the consideration that 
the, the very the very definition or the criteria based on which critically important antimicrobials are defined or classified involves or considers the fact the resistance or the antimicrobial use in the food animal sector. That's that's the first part. Now, when you move to the next part, you see this slide. This is the criteria uh, used by the WHO. I'm not really going into the details, but I just want your attention on the on the orange band, the third row, let's say. These are the three prioritization factors based on which the critically important antimicrobials, or if I may say CIAs, are further categorized into highest priority critically important antimicrobials. And all of these factors essentially either tell you either that these are the antibiotics which are either used in large number of people or used with used with uh, used in high frequency, or they are they are the antibiotics where the evidence is very strong in terms of resistance from transferring from non-human sources. So, so that's that's what I wanted to uh, emphasize upon. So this is where what you have essentially, I have just mentioned the classes, not the antimicrobials. This is the sixth revision of the list. The first version was made in 2005 and that was made, that was after WHO FAO OIE expert meeting, essentially giving a sense here that this issue has been well recognized, uh, say about, uh, uh, about two decades ago, right? So it's, it, it is well recognized between the three uh, tripartite organizations. And, uh, and, you, and of course the idea was, the intention was to, to actually uh, have a, the, so that this list basically helps in, in the prudent use of, of these antibiotics in both human and veterinary medicine. And of course, the, to support the strategies to mitigate human health risks associated with antimicrobial use in food producing animals. That's one of the, 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 the clear, let's say, aim or the objective of such a list is. Overall, there were there are about 178 antimicrobials, 17 classes are, are of CIAs, and five out of those are HPCIAs. You can see the list on the right hand side. Now, uh, moving to the next slide, just to give you a sense on the additional efforts, global efforts, which basically suggest the need to conserve CIAs. We know WHO's uh, aware classification, uh, and uh, if you see, 19 of those, uh, 19 CIAs are mentioned in the aware category. Uh, and seven are out of those are in the reserve category and 11 in the watch category. And reserve essentially means that these are last resort. These are used in highly selected patients. Watch here means that either it is a first or second choice of antibiotic, but only for specific and limited infective syndromes. There's another uh, list by WHO uh, from 2017, which is called priority pathogen list. This list essentially, again, is, is about pushing for research of new antibiotics against bacteria, which are otherwise becoming resistant uh, to CIAs. And that's the, therefore, once again, highlighting the need to, to conserve CIAs. There's this another report, a joint interagency report from the European Union released in 2021, very recent report. And this basically confirms the association between antimicrobial use in food producing animals on one hand, and the AMR found in animals as well as in humans. And this report basically focused on six antimicrobial classes. And even here, five of those were CIAs and four of those five were actually HPCIAs. Again, uh, telling us the importance of these antimicrobials. So, so coming to the main point of, of gaps, what are the gaps in the global guidance? So this is the, this is the, this is the separate OIE list. Apart from the WHO, we have a separate list by OIE of antimicrobial agents for of veterinary importance for food producing animals. This is the criteria which is mentioned. You can see criteria one and two. But what I'm trying to tell you here essentially is just to give you a sense that uh, OIE has a separate list and they have further categorized into veterinary critically important antimicrobials, which they call VCIAs and veterinary highly important antimicrobials and then veterinary important antimicrobials. And this list basically recommends the antimicrobials for several species for avian, equine, bee, rabbit, camel, fish, swine. And this was also first developed in 2017, but this one, the most recent one is, is in 2009. Uh, so what is this key issue then? So the issue here is that we have a significant overlap in this list uh, uh, and the antibiotics mentioned in the WHO list. So all in all, there are 47 antimicrobials and, uh, and nine out of nine are from the CIA classes and, uh, 
and 28 antibiotics are from four HPCIA classes. And we can see again, you go back and recall what I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. HPCIA categorization is essentially about the, the quantity, the frequency. Uh, so that basically suggests out of the CIAs, which either which are used very highly, highly frequently or in high or in high number of people, or let's say the evidence is very strong. This is that set of antibiotics and 28 antibiotics out of the 47 are, are, are actually the ones which are both, which find presence in both kinds of illness. Now, this is fine, but the very important point here is that out of these 30, out of these 39 are for more than one species, 28 are for more than three species. Now, this just give you a sense that yes, it's not really about poultry, it's not really about dairy, but it is about multiple sectors. It's about multiple species. And in any way, this list or the earlier list does not give a sense on the actual quantum used in these sectors. That is a big gap that we do not know. But one can understand from, let's say, the categorization of HPCA, this, yes, this is used quite high. And I can also tell you from our experience in India, which we figured out in the second part of the, of the report, that these actually are very popularly, very commonly used in almost all sectors. And I'm talking about these all HPCIAs. So, so it's one thing to say, yes, 47 antibiotics, 39, 28, but then there's one major issue which is, which is still left unaddressed, but we can tell you from our experience, and I'm sure many of the folks would, would agree to it, that, that these are the antibiotics commonly used. So quite likely the actual quantum of this, these anti, use of these antibiotics is very high. And, and essentially, uh, then, then I'm trying to give, give you a sense on that yes, tripartite was well, well, very well, uh, uh, it recognized the, the, uh, the public health concern due to this overlap. This was way back in 2007. Then of course, in recent documents also from the FAO, you can see that yes, there's a, there's a need felt to appropriately balance uh, and the need for careful considerations also. So this is something which we understand that yes, has been discussed, the three organizations know, but of course the expectation is that we, we kind of have much more now reduce overlap. Uh, that's, that's the expectation here. This is just a sample of how we in the report have captured this. You can see uh, the OI list on the left-hand side and then how on the most right-hand side you can see the WHO list and then the species in between and how they have categorized. Just to give you a sense uh, for details, people can refer to our report. Uh, now, this is a second important issue. And this issue is, before we actually talk about the issue, we need to really know uh, what are the different types of uses of antibiotics, for example, in, in which many ways antibiotics are used. So uh, we all know growth promotion, it is very clear. It is also very clear that it is non-therapeutic. Then treatment is also another, uh, another extreme, which is very clear. It basically is about uh, is about uh, when 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 you have very clear symptoms, clinical signs or symptoms are there. Growth promotion, we all know, it's through feed, it's routine, mass scaled, and essentially to increase the weight gain, rate of weight gain, or the efficiency of feed utilization. And but what is very important here to know is that this third part, which actually is four fourth part, is breaked into break, is is broken into two sub parts by certain agencies, but not the others is the disease prevention part. And typically this is broken into prophylaxis slash prevention, where uh, it is administered when there is to an individual or a group of animals with no clinical signs. And this is often done routinely. The second part is metaphylaxis or called control when, again, this is administered uh, wherein one or more animals are infected, but uh, others do not show clinical signs. Uh, so this acts as a treatment for those who are ill, but for but as a prevention for those who uh, for those who, who do not have symptoms. One point here to note is that yes, you can see in this Venn diagram, critically important antimicrobials are used across all these types of uses. That's one. Second, of course, uh, which I would like to mention is that in con in resource constrained countries where where uh, in practice we haven't really seen much of the difference between prophylaxis and metaphylaxis so invariably most of the use actually actually becomes prophylactic uh, and particularly in the poultry sector which is very very difficult to actually know which which bird is is ill and what is the status with others so this is this is a very contentious area and some people recognize this as therapeutic but this is clearly clearly non therapeutic because it is routine, because it is, it is mass, it is known to group. So this is one clearly contentious issue and that we will of course see in the issue number three. 
So coming back to this issue, there is a need, when we looked at the guidance from these three key organizations, WHO, OIE, and FAO, it was very clear that their, that their guidance vis-a-vis -vis growth promotion, treatment, prevention, and control varied. There was some, in certain aspects, there was incoherence, and that is what we will refer to in this slide. So, but this, I just want to let you know, we have captured the actual language in the report, which is also mentioned in the subsequent slides, but for easy reference, you try to give a sense on, I mean, how you could come, how you could compare. We've used these words like should not be used. For example, wherever the sense was that, yes, it should not be used or it should be avoided. We've used the word could be used where it, it was giving that sense. So uh, you can see that uh, uh, we, have, we have segregated this into four types of uses. And then we have also segregated into three sets of rows. And all these are critically important ones. The first set of, of row is about the highest priority critically important antimicrobials. Uh, and only two classes and one particular antibiotic, which is cholestin. And this is because OIE actually used this, gave us specific recommendations for this kind of, uh, this subset of the HPCIAs. The second set of rows you can see is essentially about the other, other set of uh, HPCIAs. And third is about CIAs, which are not HPCIAs, other than the HPCIAs. And then you can, and if you take a look at this, you can see uh, that the green color typically uh, is, reflects the coherence and the red text typically reflects the incoherence. Now, for example, in case of chloroquinolones and third and fourth generation cephalosporins, as well as cholestin, uh, we can see by and large for all these four type of uses, WHO, OIE, and FAO, uh, uh, what they, the, their, the recommendations, they basically say it should not be used except uh, where the OIE is saying that these antimicrobials can be used or could be used for control and treatment. So that's one level of incoherence that we could figure out. Then we moved on to other kinds of HPCIAs, macrolides in particular, used extensively in, 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 in almost all uh, food producing animal sector. Uh, here we could see that once again, WHO was not, was, was a, was of the view that these should not be used in any of the purpose. FAO Amit, was also of the view. Amit, yes. yeah. Amit you're really uh, stretching it. So I've given I'm you so, a fair amount of time, huh? five more minutes, that's it. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So, uh, so that's, uh, you can see the OIE here also, there's some incoherence in what the OIE is saying versus the FO and WHO. You can see that yes, these antibiotics cannot be used for prevent, can be used for prevention, control and treatment. Coming to the critically important ones, uh, the other ones last set of, uh, we can again see that yes, uh, there was some degree of incoherence uh, with reference to prevention and control. Uh, so that's, that's the summary of the incoherence which we wanted to talk about. So overall, there is a greater degree of uniformity with regard to use of antimicrobials as growth promoters and their phase out, uh, uh, phase out of HPCIs in the same purpose. The difference was essentially in, in the disease prevention and control as well as HPCIs for treatment. And we could see more coherence in WHO and FAO. So these are the, these, these are, this is the actual wording. I will not now go into this, the actual wording. So I will, I mean, I'll just tell you, this is what the WHO said. Uh, this is what uh, the, the OIE said with reference to uh, the, the two sets of uh, HPCIAs. This is what the uh, OIE again said with reference to growth promoter. Here, I just want to emphasize on one part. It mentions about risk analysis, essentially. And the, the only point here is that resource constraint, constraint countries actually cannot do risk analysis. And moreover, there's no global list here, uh, which, which any country can leverage upon. So growth promoters can still be used and moreover, we know that there's no risk analysis done for many of the antibiotics in India, but growth promoters, they are used as growth promoters. So this is something which is important to note. Uh, something something on, the, on the antibiotics only, which are referred for, which are otherwise referred to be only in human use, we can see. Uh, there still is a scope in the OIE where you can have even those antibiotics which are right now not listed, but still can in future be used if required under exceptional situations. So. That's the guidance from FAO, very clearly laid out. I have talked about it. That's the guidance from FAO on the aquaculture, again, very clearly laid out. I have mentioned in the, in, in the, in the report as well as it's reflected in the earlier slide. Uh, now, this is about codex. We can see uh, we have not really compared this. Uh, we have focused on the tripartite, but essentially, I, wanted to br I want to bring the attention of the, of the viewers here only to this, this, this new under... 
uh, review kind of a, a code of practice. And if you see that principle five and principle seven uh, are agreed, but principle six is not agreed. And if you see principle six, you, you, it basically suggests that, that there is some discussion about uh, uh, including control metaphylaxis as, as, as therapeutic use, considering those as therapeutic use. So this is certainly not decided. This is yet to be adopted, uh, but just that's why we have not really compared this, but just to bring to the attention of the viewers, we have mentioned this. Uh, that's the issue number three uh, about disease prevention, very contentious issue. So just here, the point here uh, is that yes, it's the way these are these are these are categorized. For example, WHO says therapeutic growth prevention, disease prevention. FAO says it the other way. OIE uses uses a completely different way, which is veterinary anti veterinary medical use, veterinary non medical use, and and this basically leads to the confusion. So so clearly this confusion of so first it is it is a quite a different way of categorization uh, than WHO and OIE. OIE. Second, it implies that prevention and control are similar and treatment are similar. Uh, third, it also implies that control and prevention can happen under veterinary supervision, which we haven't really seen in our part of the world. So, so that's, the, that's the issue. This is just the, the definition of disease prevention. And we can clearly see how the, the, the different words used and then, of course, the different uh, different way these are subcategorized, and this again adding to the confusion part. Uh, coming to the recommendations part, we are basically at a very broad level. We think uh, there sh there should be a uniform guidance, strong guidance for countries, which is which is very clear, very clear message for all sectors, for all types of uses. Uh, what should be what should be immediately prohibited? What should be phased out? Uh, it should be strong and ambitious. Uh, and, and then of course, uh, uh, a specific recommendation around the disease prevention part, they, uh, it has to be, there has to be consensus around it, in particular about the routine preventative use, but there also is a need in this case is about a stronger recommendation. And, and then of course, uh, all this will actually help in reducing the chances of misinterpretation and will generate greater consensus. And countries, of course, we are saying that, uh, this information will help countries to develop their sector-specific roadmaps and, of course, their targets for CIA use and reductions. Uh, this is just about trying to know more about the use and the surveillance vis-a-vis -vis CIA. So, so that's it from my side, Sunitaji. Uh, thank you, and yeah. I'm sorry for the... For no, the no, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for this work that you have done, you, Rajeshwari and Deepak. Uh, can you um, stop share? Yes. Uh, so thank you so much for this work. I know there's so much that you have to say and there's so much uh, depth in your uh, study that you could go on. But I think we have an amazing panel and I want to put this information out because the idea is to have a discussion on how we move forward. So what, I, what we have agreed to do so that everyone is on board, uh, we have a fair number of people who've joined us from across the world. Uh, so the way we will do this for the next, we have a whole hour now and I would try and do this for at least 50 minutes and leave the 10 minutes for uh, questions or something that is really burning to be asked. Um, I'm going to take the three issues that Amit has discussed in his presentation and ask each one of the panelists, we'll take one issue and then I will give the floor to all panelists to discuss it. And um, we'll also have, if you have something that you would like to say to some other panelists, let's spend some time on this. Then I'll come to the second and then to the third issue. So we, we have time and let's take the first issue that has been raised, which is really about the significant overlap in antimicrobials, which are considered cons uh, critical for humans and food producing animals. Uh, the list that Amit showed from WHO and, um, and then OIE and um, what then is the way ahead. Uh, can I start in this case with uh, Peter um, uh, from WHO to, to discuss this? And then, of course, I will ask all the panelists. Thank you so much, Sunita. And um, first of all, I wanted to congratulate you and, of course, the authors, Amit and his team, to the report, which I read with great interest. It's really um, very interesting to see that you went through all the 
documents that you presented that were published by OIE, WHO, FAO. And I really like um, how you presented also the OIE list, the CIA list, matching one against the other, showing the overlap between the agents used both in humans and in animals, but also what you did around the, the specific guidance and, and also the work when you, you show that the, the agencies are using different terms and that as a member state um, in different um, of, of these different organizations, it's confusing because the Ministry of Agriculture may align to the um, um, terms that are used by OIE, while the Ministry of Health would probably rather turn to WHO. And that leads also to maybe incoherence on a national level. So I think it's really important input for our work as a tripartite. And, and we are really, we are going to take this into account in, um, we are going to review the CIA list, this WHO list of critically important antibiotics next year. So we are starting the process at the moment. And your study, I already forwarded it to the, my team members and said, Yo, this is an important study. We need to, to look at this when we are doing the review. And, and so we are going to try to, um, to look at this. And we are working with OIE and FAO in this process. So it's not something that we are doing on our own. Um, on this specific question, on this overlap, I think it's an unfortunate reality that there are antimicrobial agents that are used by veterinarians, by farmers, as well as by doctors to treat humans. And, and it's not, I don't think that we can roll back history and now, you know, basically what we would have to do would have to tell veterinarians you can't use any of these products anymore, and that is not going to work. I think um, we, we can try to disentangle. We can, we can re certainly try to prevent use of new antibiotics that come to the market in animals. I think that's something that we certainly should do. But even there, you know, there are drug development is something that is done by private entities. We, we know that there is a company in Switzerland that is pushing the development of a, of a veterinary antibiotic for humans. So if this one comes to market and for the treatment of, or, you know, for, of humans, what are we going to do? Are we then telling the veterinarians, well, you use this for ages now, we, you know, they would literally, it would be literally feeling like stealing from them, something they had in their cupboard, they were using, and now we test it in humans and we say, oh, no, we take it. So I think it's, it's the, the reality, is, um, is complex and, and I think I like what you showed in your report at the end, which is then the third part where you speak about for what kind of, uh, do we use these agents to treat animals or for control of disease in animals or for prevention of disease in animals or for growth promotion. And for example, as WHO, we see absolutely no reason why any of these antibiotics that are used in humans are used for growth promotion. I think that is something which we can very clearly state. And I'm very happy about this, the global leaders group where Sunita and Scott are members of, and they issued a statement um, this week where you know they are saying that we should stop using these antibiotics for growth promotion because it's a waste and, and they, there is no necessity to do this. Thank you, Peter. Now that helps to explain. And I think before I will come to all of our next, but uh, you know, it's very clear, Peter, I mean, we are based in India, we work with different sectors of the food producing uh, business. And even when it came to pesticides, CSE was one organization, uh, which actually said we are not anti pesticide, we said, how do you have safe use? And how do you minimize exposure? And I think that's the same conversation we are having here. So we are not, we're not saying you cannot use anything. But we're asking a question, and I think that's really the moot question we're asking. Is there, um, you know, the overlap that exists between the, uh, the veterinary use and the human use? Is there any way that we could actually find a way to be able to reduce the overlap, to be able to minimize it, to say that there is some groups that will not get used? So, Olafur, can I now ask you for your uh, position on this? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, very good day to all of you, uh, both my fellow panelists and you, Chair, and, uh, and uh, all the participants. 
Uh, well, first of all, let me commend CEC for its work in general on AMR, not only this report, but in general. I have actually been uh, so lucky to be able to, to work with you on several occasions around the world. And it is really a pleasure and uh, commendable what you are actually doing and uh, pulling the wagon with us uh, all in the hopefully in the right direction. I think we are pulling in the right direction in the same direction also. And I think that's very important. So uh, very good day to you. Uh, when it comes to the the overlap of antimicrobials, I think, yes, there is definitely a big overlap uh, between the two lists. They are set up in a little, little bit different way, but we have to think also about, you know, antimicrobials, they are life-saving medicines. Uh, of course, for human medicine, I mean, we know that the, the, the current way of human medicine is working is really relies on anti antimicrobials. The same for the animal health sector. So, I mean, they are, they are life-saving for human health, animal health, animal welfare. We should not forget animal welfare in, in all these uh, issues and for food security, which I suppose uh, the Jungsia will also talk about later on. So, there are actually not so many antimicrobials available. There are not many antimicrobial classes available in the world. So it is maybe not so strange, so it should maybe not come as a surprise that there is overlap in these lists. Uh, what and how this can be addressed uh, is maybe something that we sh definitely should discuss. Uh, and I mean, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, revision of the, the WHO list, uh, revision of the OIE list, which is ongoing. Um, it doesn't happen in, in silos, if you can say so. We are actually participating in the work of each other. So, so we are, you see, I think, in the recommendations of the OIE list that we are actually taking into consideration the WHO list, the CIA list. And um, one thing I want to maybe clarify with the OIE list is that this is not a recommendation of use of antimicrobials. This is a compilation of all veterinary medicinal antimicrobials that are that have a market authorization in the world. So it's kind of a list of what is authorized for use around the world. And I mean, one thing that is, of course, very important when you think about the two lists is that one is for many, many species and the other one is, is for humans. So that is one of the issues that is, of course, there is a difference. Um, so when it comes to recommendations in the OIE list, that is actually restrictions on the use. So. So restricting the use for some specific of the, 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 uh, the, I mean, from the list, highest critically important antimicrobials on the, on the CIA list. So I think that is also important. The recommendations, they also refer to the prudent use of, of uh, antimicrobials, which is in the terrestrial and the aquatic animal health code of Hawaii. Uh, and there, this should always be read with that. We also, as Amit mentioned, we distinguish very clearly between, uh, you know, treatment control and prevention on the one side as a necessity in many cases. And then on the other hand, the growth promotion, which we don't see as, as a prudent use of, of antimicrobials. Just so we really, we uh, support, of course, the phasing out of uh, antimicrobials as growth promoters. Um, I, I think maybe- all of four, but yeah. the next issue when we discuss, you know, in terms of advice. So the first issue really is to discuss, and what I'm hearing from you is, this is a compilation of all the antimicrobials used across the world and for different things, which does tell us that we do have a problem. So. We do need to address it and we need to find a way to be able to move ahead on it. And I'll come back to you all for on the second issue. But let me turn to Jungsia now. Jungsia, though, they, I mean, if you, um, well, obviously uh, the lists that, uh, are not so much the FAO uh, 
list, but uh, your position on this. And I will come back to the advice that FAO gives later. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sumita. And also, uh, good evening, all the panelists and uh, the colleagues, participants. So first, I really, would really appreciate this CSE report. This is a very, very nice report, very important, especially the three uh, issues raised in this report are very relevant. And I believe to this discussion will, um, the, all the key issues and the solutions would be very helpful. So uh, first, I think for this, this uh, report really did a very good analysis on this uh, list. I think regarding the EMU in food producing animals, um, the tripartite organization actually has the same direction. For example, we all promote responsible use and reduce the unnecessary use or antimicrobials and also phasing out growth uh, promoter. So I would like to just to share a few uh, views on food and agricultural perspectives. So in FAO, the FAO action plan on EMR is the fundamental document to guide FAO's action, effort of support to our members, uh, focusing on building capacity and minimize all the EMR risk in food and agricultural sectors. But this action plan is not a standard setting. We follow all the relevant international standards from ORE, from, F, uh, from WHO and the Codex. And our new FAO action plan and from 2021 and 2025, just uh, adopted by FAO Council recently, and it will be launched uh, very soon. So one of the key, we have five key objectives under this new action plan. One of the key uh, objective is really focusing on promoting responsible use. This including some key elements, for example, improving access to expert advice on the appropriate antimicrobial use, and the training of stakeholders in better and antimicrobial stewardship for treatment, control, preventing the use of antimicrobials, phasing out the use of antimicrobials in animals for growth promotion, and also reduce the overall need for antimicrobials by improving uh, infection prevention in hygiene uh, by the biosecurity uh, vaccination. So, um, I think regarding the overlap, I think I fully agree with uh, the report and also uh, Peter Oliver also mentioned that this is a, a reality. And then, then I, I, I'm very interested in the, in the report from the animal side, because not only there's a overlap with use in humans, but it, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to know in which animal species uh, that specific products were used, for example, for the same com uh, commercial products. It, it's indicated for multiple animal species, which this means you can't do, we can't do like source attribution. We do not know where the resistance come from. So I, I think this meeting is really a good timing for us because FAO is now initiated a discussion to develop a list for plant use, for antimicrobial plant use. This report really gave us a very good perspective because we are now in a very early initial discussion. We really could think about from both human and animal perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you That would be very good if you could do that now. Uh, Scott, can you help to uh, guide us on this? It'll probably be fairly brief. I think it's been covered really well, the overlap. Like it's it's present and it's going to be present. There's just no way we can have separate veterinary and human drugs at this point. There's too much, too, too many limitations in what's available and too limited drug development. So it really comes down to, I think what we'll talk about later is how do we improve use? How do we reduce the implications of use in animals on humans and the environment? But the one thing maybe to bring in that hasn't been brought in so far, and all of our races a little bit, that, that animals is a very broad term. And we try to lump everything in the humans and animals in the environment. And when it comes to the critically important antimicrobial side, the, the necessity of different drugs varies quite a bit. So there may be a drug that is really important in one animal species, um, but really not that important in others. So there, we need to be a little more granular in how we address some of these things. And similarly, the implications of use of an antibiotic in one species um, in terms of human health risk might be very different. So how an antibiotic gets used in egg or in egg producing chickens, the risk to people 
might be much higher or much lower than similar use of that antibiotic in fish or in beef cattle. So we need to be focusing on evidence, which is often not very strong, um, or at least not very granular to, to address this issue more. So the overlap is going to be there. So we have to learn how to live with it, I think. And we have to make sure we don't oversimplify the issue because this is a complex ecological problem that's going to defy an easy solution. Yeah, Scott, we shouldn't oversimplify it, but I do think that, you know, given the fact that there is this overlap, and yes, we accept that they will be used in animals and, and in humans, and both need medicines. I mean, it's a medicine we're giving, and they need to be treated, and animals are critically important for, for our human beings. My, my one question is that, um, um, should we not be thinking about a set which is just not used in animals at all? Is there no way that we could talk about a group um, or a list which is not used? And Oliver, I see you You have your hand up, please. Yeah, and, um, go ahead, Oliver, if you want to take it first. Oliver? And thank you very I'll much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think, I mean, I, I, I think it is quite, uh, just, just to tip in on with some information on just what Scott was saying, and I think that's really important. Uh, you know, there are few antimicrobials in a way uh, available in the world. And what I just heard, I mean, also just to draw your attention to when we talk about use in animals, there, there are actually, there is actually data collection going on in use of in animals, which as we have reports every year on what the use is, and it is getting better and better. The data that we get is getting better and better. Uh, also on the list, rightly as, as Scott was mentioning, uh, I mean, the different species, antimicrobials are used in a different way. And uh, we are actually now working on the list to get more granularity, to try to understand better what is really used where. And then we can say what is really important because we need the baseline. We really need to know what is really used where. But so just to say that. Makes sense. Scott, do you want to add anything to it before I move to the next point? I can't remember what I was going to say before that. No, I, I think it's-, it's, it's you, you can I get up with it. Yeah, we'll come back point. to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the next point really, I mean, all of you have alluded to it and, and I'm at, discussed it in great depth. So I want to start with maybe Scott this time on, you know, this is table which uh, Amit Rajeshwari and Deepak have put together, which I think sort of captures it very well. It's on page 33 of our report, which is about the guidance that is given. And it's really about WHO, OIE and FAO. And that's the point that all of you were making that it's not just the overlap we need to be concerned about, but what is it used for? And what is it that we are saying should not be used for? And in this table, in some senses, it's very clear that, you know, uh, there are big differences in terms of particularly between OIE and WHO in the different uh, highest category, in the highest priority, um, as well as in critically important antimicrobials. And I think that's the second point that we wanted to discuss is the need for convergence. And, I, and I'm particularly pushing, going to push you on this a little bit, please, because please see from where we are sitting. When we did why did we do this study? We did this study because we started looking at sector by sector and having a conversation with the different um, livestock and food sectors in India. And the problem that we are having is that they are getting contrary advice. I mean, when we talk to the, the Ministry of Agriculture in India, or you talk to the people who are working on poultry, they are saying, this is the advice we are getting. It can be used. And you go to the Ministry of Health and they say, no, WHO says no. So that convergence is the point that we want to discuss. So Scott, can I start with you on this? Yeah, and, and one thing I'd like to thank you for is by putting food producing animals in all this. The, the issues in animals are quite different. We have food producing animals, we have working animals, we have companion animals. Um, and it's laughing because he knows I'm <laughs> going to comment about this, but um, there are different issues with different types of animals. So it, it's really, Good that you have that in there because, again, we, we have this broad group of animals. Um, and I think the table really raises some good discussion. I think part of it's harmonization of terminology, part of it's harmonization of recommendations, and part of it, I think, is, again, more granularity in what you recommend. 
because what's available in different animal species is different based on the drugs that we know we can use safely. And we're better off using potentially a higher tier drug that we know how to use safely and effectively. We know withdrawal times and we know environmental contamination issues and everything else than a less effective drug where we're going to have to use it longer or use it and then use another drug and then use another drug and still end up with problems down the road. So, and I'm not trying to give an argument to use higher tier drugs, but I'm just saying that, you know, the complexity that comes in here. And I think the should not be used and could be used is, is probably too binary. Um, like the, the general concept with anything with antimicrobial stewardship is, you know, tiering doesn't mean yes or no, tiering can bring in a preference. So macrolides are, you know, a controversial area with the WHO ranking because they're, they're, they're different in different ranking systems. Is use of a macrolide um, higher risk than use of some other drugs in certain species? Well, maybe not. Maybe in, in a, maybe in a, a beef cow, use of a macrolide actually doesn't increase the risk of resistance in humans uh, versus use of that species, use of that drug in a different species would. But where I was going, I think with the tiering of, of track was, um, like could be used and should not be used. Um, for me, it's, you know, should not be used in lieu of a lower tier drug because there may not be another drug option. And you get into the discussion, okay, we have health and we have welfare issues and we have food security and all these things that come together. We need to be pushing towards not using antimicrobials when we, we can because we overuse them, obviously. And then we need to be using drugs that cause the least damage. And sometimes you end up with, as you get through that cascade, you have what we consider a higher tier drug and they have to decide whether that use is justifiable or not. And I think probably in many times it is, but too often we just jump to, we'll use this drug because we've used that drug or because it's marketed well, or because we don't really know much about it. There are a lot of cultural issues in culture. I mean, just culture in terms of practice. We do this because we do this and challenging dogma. Uh, like there are a lot of dogmatic things in use of antimicrobials and animals that we really need to challenge because things are done that people think make sense, but we don't really have the backing behind. So I think I got off topic there a bit, but I, I think this is a good chart to start some discussion and then start to figure out, okay, what are some of the, the complexities of the issues? And then how do we actually change the messaging so that we can get closer to this? Yeah. So I don't think we can get to a yes, no, but I think we can get closer to this. I mean, for us, yes, no is very important because where we sit, uh, we need clear guidance. And I think that's what we are seeking right now because there's a lot of, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of space that uh, veterinarians have, but you know, from where we are, we have limited capacities. So we need to have clear guidance. But Junsia, let me bring you in. Actually, can I make one more comment? There's, you know, I, think, I think the guidance part is really, really critical. Yeah. But the guidance isn't always yes, no. But the, the guidance is, is like you need decision support um and when it's yes it's how to use the drug I and mean, that's one of the big issues is because people are risk averse and people are going to use an antibiotic if, if they're unclear because scott, they're afraid you're, scott you're missing the point here we are asking very clearly we are saying the three agencies there's a yeah. clear question about when you would use antimicrobials would you use it for growth promotion for prevention, for control, and for treatment. And then you have the classes of antimicrobials, which is the critically important, the not so important, you know, and the question is, is there uniformity in the advice that is being given in both the classes of antibiotics as well as the use of antibiotics and for what? And that coherence, in my view, that table, I mean, there's a lot of data there, but that table where, which sums up this is so important because that's ultimately nationally, we talk about a national action plan on antimicrobial resistance and the beginning and the end of it is clarity. And that clarity has to come with this information. So I'm sorry to jump in on this, but Tungsia, uh, let me bring you in on this point. Thank you. Actually, this is a very, very uh, good point. And I believe from the three organizations, we should have kind of a clear guidance. We should provide clear guidance to, to our members. And we all know that the CRAs, a, uh, it, the risk, if we, we use the CRAs in the agri, uh, food producing animals. But in the meantime, we also know that there's a no like one size fit all approach to minimize the, all the use of CRAs for all settings. And we can see the complexity of the, like for example, the medical decision making surrounding antibiotics use. 
and the, the difference of the level of veterinary services and the, the availability of pharmaceutical products in local settings. So maybe sometimes in, at a national level that requires some flexi, flexible uh, guidance. But anyway, we are looking, we are trying to working on to find some solutions. For example, in, in Asia and the Pacific, and FAO working with ORE, we are working on the EMU guidelines at a farm level in, for Asia and the Pacific. So it, it is, we start from regions, we, we are not, we are hoping it could be extended to the uh, global level. It's kind of to explore how to provide the more clear guidance uh, at the farm level, over. Okay, so Olafur, and I have uh, someone who's just said something. I have lots of comments and I'm not gonna be able to do justice to it. But uh, uh, Manojji uh, Satsena has just said, cholestin should not be used, should not be allowed to be used in veterinary uh, practices. And of course it's aimed at India, um, uh, but uh, I think that's the, that's the first question. That's also the question. But uh, Olafur, on this whole issue of uh, how to bring the three agencies together to make sure that as far as food producing animals is concerned, that there is a clear understanding on which class of antibiotics to use. I mean, class meaning how critically important it is or highest priority is it and for what? Olafur? Yeah, thanks again. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Scott actually said quite a lot on it actually. Be, we, of course, acknowledge, I think, all the three organizations that there is a lack of coherence in, in this. Uh, Jungsha mentioned in the beginning, I mean, there is, however, you know, the general direction of the tripartite is really much aligned. And we are actually working more and more together and more closely with UNEP uh, also. So, I mean, as you know, we have now the tripartite joint secretariat on AMR. Uh, we are working on a tripartite strategic framework that is being drafted now. So, so we are really trying to work and align our work in, in all aspects of response to AMR. We have the multi partner trust fund uh, up and running on AMR, which is actually uh, assisting countries in implementing their national action plans. And I think that brings me to one of the things that is really important. I mean, these... All these tools, they are actually a, a, a tool for the countries, isn't it? For them developing their national policies. And, you know, uh, so I think this is really something that we have to always emphasize. The, the things that happen on the ground, these are the things that really matter in the end. And these tools are available and can be used and should be used in developing the national policies because that's what really matters in a way. Uh, if we, I mean, we, of course, I think we should always think about how can we best provide the best, um, uh, what shall I say, I mean, the best support to actually the national uh, uh, authorities. Uh, I think maybe this is something that we should also think about when we are talking national authorities. We are actually seeing a lack of, we are maybe seeing a lack of, of resources to really implement what the guidelines are saying. And, you know, controls, we, are, we, have, we have problems in in, uh, in access to antimicrobials, in substandard falsified medicines, flooding markets. So, I mean, the, for instance, the veterinary services or the national authorities dealing with this, this is something that really needs resources to be able to do what they're supposed to do. And, and this is something that we really should make sure that we are actually addressing at the same time. We really need to assist countries in having the capability to do what these uh, guidelines are saying. Uh, I think that's maybe one of the issues that I really would like to bring up in this. Um, so No, very good point, Olafur. It's just that, and I'll turn to Peter now, but the point is that, you know, we have a one health approach and we are talking about a one health approach. 
And on one hand of the approach, most critically, Peter requires agencies to work together. And when I'm looking at, when we sit in India, it requires, you know, antimicrobials are no longer just the business of the Ministry of Health. They're also the business of the Ministry of Agriculture, of the departments of, life, of, of fish and livestock and animal care. And, you know, what we are finding is that because there isn't this coherence, and I'm using the word again and again, because there is a problem here. Um, we can't have uh, them working together in countries. And that's really where my problem is, because at the end of the day, if we are asking our Ministry of Health and our Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock to work together and animal care to work together and say, listen, you must come up with a very clear list. I mean, India has banned cholestine, but we need to make sure that we can have more details and we can have much better guidance um, in terms of what can be used and what can't be used. And for what can it be used and what it can't be used. And that's really where we are finding that unless the three agencies come together and put your head together. I mean, in India, we have the system. You need to be locked up in a room until you kill each other and whatever comes out, whoever wins. <laughs> but you have to tell us very clearly that there is a clear understanding amongst the three of you that these critically important, highest priority will not be used. And if at all they're used, they're used in exceptional circumstances for only treatment. And I think unless we get that, it's going to be very difficult to translate it down because there's already so, um, so, so much in terms of where the, who actually prescribes it, where the medicines are available, all that is a different sort of Pandora's box. But the first thing is to know what can be done and what can't be done. And I think from our part of the world, what can't be done is as important as what can be done. Peter? Yeah, thank you, Sunita, for this um, the very clear statement. Um, I think you really depicted very, very interestingly the different guidance that the three organizations issued, and and in you know in, um, and I I agree. I mean, it is for member states confusing if they get different guidance on the same products on how to use them from different organizations. Um, the WHO guidance comes from the WHO guidelines on use of medically important antimicrobials in uh, food producing animals that we issued in 2017. And definitely, I mean, we pushed the agenda with that document. And for our member states were divided. Some member states praised us. They praised the guidelines that said, this is the way forward. This is what we want to see from you. Others were very unhappy and said, this is not based on science. This is not okay. And these were countries typically which had a very strong industry of food producing animals. So um, it is a very controversial area. It is also an area where um, industries have a keen interest and um, they have powerful lobbies in certain member states. So certain member states are defending different positions in WHO versus in OIE and FIAO on the same issue. So um, I think you know, these differences may be reflected in the end also in documents that you, you see coming out of the organizations. Um, what is also interesting is that the organizations, we, we have different cultures because we are grown organizations that we have different ways of functioning. So if, for example, the WHO guidelines were done with an, um, going through this guidelines process, which is a very formalized process in WHO, which is totally independent from what member states want to see. Member states don't have to adopt it. Member states have no say in those. We often run into issues with member states. For example, when we revised the guidelines on the daily sugar intake and we um, recommended lower sugar intake because of the risk of diabetes, for example, we had a European member state who, who came and complained because they, had, uh, they were under pressure from their local industry who was producing chocolate spread that the children were putting on their bread in the morning. And it was purely to defend this local industry. So um, I think it's, you know, that is the, the reality we are working in. 
Um, having said that, I think also what Scott said, and also I saw it in the comments, we can provide the guidance, countries need to adapt. Countries have different animal species for which they use antibiotics and they may have to use different antibiotics in India than you use in Germany, also because of the climate, um, because of the resistant levels. And I, we probably can get around it if we are more, as Scott said, if we are more granular in our guidance. And, and I looked up the, the WHO document you know, it looks very, very blunt. We say should not be used, should not be used, should not be used. But then we have this asterisk, which says mm. the use may be permitted if no other drug from lower categories is available to treat infected animals or to prevent dissemination of diagnosed disease within groups of animals. Meaning we say should not be used, but we, don't we do not want to take it completely away from veterinarians who need to treat animals that are sick Absolutely. or who need to prevent actually spread of disease in a herd. And that is, I think, the, the way forward. Yes, the principle is should not be used, but if you have to use it, yes, in a specific situation for a specific species, in a, for a specific outbreak, then go for it. So I think there's so much we can do by reducing the use in particular, probably in prevention of disease, where, where a lot of things happen which are not based on science, which are not overseen by veterinarians, where farmers are using these, these products without even knowing that they are critically important antibiotics, without even knowing that they are giving antibiotics to the animals. I think there we can probably make so much progress in an area where, um, which is less, was conflicted where we have where so I think we need to to focus on where we can make progress. Mm -hmm. We will go back and see how can we align these guidance, and probably we need to be a bit more granular in what we are doing. So that brings us actually, Peter, and I will start with Olafur there, who has his hand up, and then Scott um, on the third issue. And you can of course add anything else you want. Uh, which is really about the definitions and, you know, and how do you uh, treat the difference, the definition of disease prevention. And I have to tell you, um, so from my side, a little bit of history about this. And Amit and I've had a lot of discussions on this. So Scott, you remember, um, no, you were not part of the, um, so the, the earlier avatar of the uh, GLG was the IACG. And, um, and you know, for us, I, uh, one of the big things that we were fighting for in IATC was that we needed the growth promoter to be stopped. And, you know, our understanding of growth promoters had come because Amit and uh, we had done two studies, one on antibiotic use in honey, where we had found a lot of antibiotics being used in honey as growth promoters. And then of course we had done a poultry industry study where we had tested chicken in India and we had found massive uses, um, I mean, uh, amounts of antibiotics in the chicken. But the reason it was there was because it was a growth promoter. So we were pushing that, you know, this should definitely stop. I mean, you know, even if you use it for prevention or for treatment, this should stop. And then Amit really sort of really fought with me on this and said, you know, this is not good enough because if you stop it as growth promoter, they just switch it and call it prevention. And he showed me data from the EU where the use as growth promoters has gone down, but prevention has gone up. And therefore disease prevention, the definition of disease prevention for us became so important to understand because we know treatment, but prevention we needed to understand. Amit, have I captured that accurately what you and I have been discussing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that's really where uh, we started looking at this whole issue of, you know, how do you, because if you're telling the Indian government that we are very happy that you stop growth, uh, the user's growth promoter, but then it continues to be used, then how do we how do we define prevention? And that again, uh, Amit and Rajeshwari and Deepak have done this very nice table. I love the tables they have done because they've kind of helped to bring us uh, sharply to the point. And that's on page 35, which is the three definitions. So Olafur, can I bring you in on that? Because that's also part of the challenge for the future. We've already discussed, they will be overlapped. 
Then we have said, yes, we will have some better coherence, but they, these will have to be used for critically for when animals are ill, when there is no other alternative. But then the question becomes, how do you make sure that the overuse stops? And the overuse can stop when there is um, use of antimicrobials in, you know, in, in more ma massive ways, not in targeted ways, not because my, my livestock is ill today and I have to give this. It's more as a preventive, uh, Olafur? Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, just, just to, just to a, a small comment before I start on this, on, on what Peter was saying, uh, and I think also referring to what Scott said before, I think, you know, some of the issues are language uh, when there is no coherence, because, I mean, as Peter was just saying, I mean, he is actually saying very much the similar recommendations as are in the OIE list but worded in a different way. So I think that is really something that we should actually look at. How, how do we really make sure that we are talking the same language? And I've, we've seen it in other aspects also that we are using different languages and different words. So, but I mean, coming back to the prevention, I think that that is a very, very interesting uh, and very important, I think, point because as you know, and as is very well explained in the in the report, uh, the OIE distinguishes between veterinary use and non-veterinary use, and all veterinary use has to be prudent and responsible. Just so I mean, that is the recommendation. Really, you have to use code the uh, the terrestrial animal health code 0.610. Please look at it. It's 0.610 in the code where you actually see that you have to use all antibiotics or antimicrobials in a prudent and responsible way. And then it, when it comes to prevention, which is in, in our definition, part of a veterinary use. So it's treat, prevent and control. And, and then the other thing that is non-veterinary, which we don't uh, think is, is uh, a prudent use. So, I mean, we have to think about the definition. And I think it's important. The definition is to administer an antimicrobial agent to individual or a group of animals at a risk of acquiring a specific infection in a specific situation. And I think what I want to stress is the specific infection, specific infection, or in a specific situation. That means it cannot be used routinely. You have to look at the, the prudent use also. It should not be used routinely or, 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 you know, uh, or uh, for a, a, a long period. It is something that has to be to a specific infection and specific situation. Then people might be twisting the definition and saying what is actually non-veterinary use and calling it prevention. And that is, I mean, prevention can never come instead of uh, biosecurity measures and, and good animal practices. I think that is really the, the most important thing. So how do, we, how do we make sure that people understand? I mean, you can, you can actually, the EU legislation now, the new EU legislation is you know, a little bit in that line, isn't it? It's still a legitimate use, but very much restricted. And I think that is the way to go. I mean, we, we, we really have to make sure that we have the possibility because in some situations, prevention is actually promoting, if it is done correctly, it actually diminishes the use of antimicrobials. And that's something that we really have to always remember. If we do it in the way it is supposed to be done, then it can actually help us in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. But, if we misuse it, yeah. then we're in trouble. Then we are actually calling something that might be considered as growth promotion as prevention. And that is not correct. Olafur, um, sorry, sorry to labor this point before I go to Scott. Actually, uh, and maybe we can have a bilateral discussion on this further. Maybe Amit and you can, and Rajeshwari can talk about it. We are deeply concerned about this point at uh, OIE because we do feel that 
the mixing of the three uh, for medical, the prevention, the control, and the treatment, which is different from the way WHO does it and FAO does it, is actually providing great space for misuse to happen. And maybe that, and definitely that's not your intention because you've kind of said, what's medical, what's non-medical. So you, you've assumed that people have, have, have taken into account that even when they do prevention, it is for medical purposes. But how do you define that more carefully and the translation of that as it goes down? And the fact that the, the, the very same words prevention control are used differently from FAO, by FAO and WHO. Basically, that is where our problem is. So maybe we could have a more detailed discussion on this later on. I think we just want to flag that issue to you right now, that it's clearly an issue of deep concern for us because we don't want to see these, it, it, you know, the preventive use is really about the, how much um, you can prevent the use of antimicrobials. Scott. No, I think there are a lot of really good points that maybe I'll just try to expand on fairly quickly. Like we certainly need clarity and we need harmonization, right? Because we don't need confusion and we don't need people trying to, you know, pit one group against the other. But ultimately, we're not going to regulate or define our way out of this. Like we're going to educate our way out of this. Like a AMR is the outcome, right? It's not the intervention target. AMR is the problem. Antimicrobial use, and you mentioned misuse a lot, but antimicrobial use is the issue because some of the things we consider regular use are, are overuse. There's a lot of over preventive use. And if we want to control the use of CIAs, we need to control the use of antibiotics, which is we need to control people from wanting to use antibiotics. And that's education about management, that's infection prevention and control. And it's education about antibiotic use because we have a lot of antibiotic use that occurs just because people don't know. They don't have good guidance. People are risk averse. If in doubt, they will use an antibiotic. And we've, we've done some really simple interventions on farms in Canada that have massively dropped the antibiotic use just by educating and empowering the people on the farm. So I think we need to consider this whole spectrum. Right? It's really important to think about uh, the OAD, FAO, WHO, uh, like the code all mentioned is really important to have there. But 99.9999% of people using antibiotics have never and will never read those codes. So we need the foundation to help the governments you know, regulate as possible. But we really need that education and support because ultimately there's always going to be not necessarily a loophole, but the preventive, right? What is an increased risk of disease and how to use those drugs in those situations? That's going to end up being decided ultimately at the user level, a veterinarian or producer, because we're probably not going to regulate it that much where the, exactly these things have to happen before you can use that drug. So we need to be thinking both ends of the spectrum if we're actually going to have the impact we want. No, absolutely. I mean, all of you have got a real thumbs up from Joseph who's saying, you know, it is capacity, capacity building that is critical. And thank you for pointing that out, Scott and all of you. Peter. Yeah, thank you. I, it's really um, a very good discussion. And, and I agree with Scott and, and also what you said, Sunita, the prevention is a murky area and people tend to subsume under prevention what they want to call prevention. And before it was dose promotion and then they give subtherapeutic dosages on a daily basis and they call it prevention. It's not, it's abuse. And that is where probably we, we among the CEO organization, it should be possible to really be, be very clear. Um, I wanted to pick up a couple of point, points in the, in the, in the chat. Um, somebody asked whether the guidelines, the WHO guidelines were endorsed by OIE, FAO. They were not. It was a WHO process. FAO, OIE were observers and they contributed, but these were guidelines that were adopted, issued by WHO, not by the tripartite. Um, and somebody raised also the issue about antibiotics versus antimicrobials, and I could not agree more. I Told, I don't like using antimicrobials because technically it's wrong. We don't speak about HIV treatment here. We don't speak about influenza treatment. We speak about antibiotics. What we are discussing today doesn't even apply for antifungus, which probably is the closest match to antibiotics. So yes, I totally agree. I, I'm always, I always argue against using antimicrobials. Unfortunately, even in my organization, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not part of the majority. Um, and then somebody also pointed out the difference, you know, we need to take into account the, the difference of capacity in, in, in the developed countries versus the developing countries. 
Of course, I mean, this is when we talk about should only be used under veterinary oversight. I mean, it's just not, it's not, not realistic, but, and, and even in, in, in WHO for, let's say, HIV treatment, it was the same. Initially, people wanted to say, oh, this always has to be prescribed by a doctor. Yes, if you require, if you want this, then you treat very, very, very few people in Africa. This is not acceptable. So, so I think we also need to, to break out of this, this, you know, thinking sometimes, from where we come from and, and adapting the guidance to the real world. And, and that, is, that is, of course, always a challenge when you do global guidance, because then, you know, then sometimes if we tell the Europe, oh, you don't need veterinary oversight, then, it's, then it's, that's bad, because they can do it and they should do it. But we can't request everybody to do that. So I think this is the, the, the challenge also with doing these um, you know, one global guidance and, and where we probably need to adapt more on the regional and, and country level to the, to the abilities. And what Scott said, it's education. It's how it's really implemented because whatever guidance we issue in Geneva or in Rome or in Paris, I mean, impact on the ground depends on how, what, what happens on a country level. We can only try to assist you, to help you. Um, but but I, I have no, you know, I mean, the difference is made on the ground. No, undoubtedly. But I mean, the guidance is the beginning of that process, because if the guidance is not clear, then, you know, at least what need, what should not be done is not clear. And I think that's what we are driving at, because our experience in India is, and I'm sure, uh, Junse, you will agree with this. I mean, our experience is that, you know, um, a, there is huge misuse if you allow it, if, if you say it's possible. So we need to make sure that there is some, some control over it. And for us in India, the whole issue of prevention has been to, to, to change the food systems um, as well as the livestock breeding systems so that you could actually reduce the use of antimicrobials. And, and, and therefore for us, uh, or antibiotics. I, and, and Peter, I have to say, I've lost this battle as well with Amit. I like antibiotics. I understand antibiotics. And Amit is always teaching me no. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad I have an ally on that. But Jinxia, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think this is a, first, I really agree. We should have a very clear definition. What is preventive use and what the growth promotion? Like, I like the example that you just raised, uh, Sumita. There in some countries, they ban the growth promoter, but for in preventive use, just increased. So, but actually we already, we, we are also to see another point. For example, in animals, prevention, preventive use sometimes is important. For example, for aquaculture, if we're looking at aquaculture animals. So here, I think um, our panelists already give a lot of very good points I do not want to repeat. Here I just add one point. And this is not, today we are talking about especially how to have a coherent position among tripartite global level. But we also thinking how to involve more broader stakeholders. Yes. So it, now we are, um, maybe you already noticed there is a public discussion on the multi powder stakeholder uh, platform. This is one of the three governance structures uh, the first one is the Global Leaders Group, like Scott, Sunita, you're the Global Leaders members. And now we are trying to, the tripartite is establishing a partnership platform to hopefully we can bring um, all the different stakeholders, including governments, private sectors, academia, and we can really discuss, we can share, we can reach consensus, especially on this very specific, uh, very important topics. So this public discussion will is now still open. It will be closed by September 18. So you can, whoever the participants and the panelists, you can um, search and uh, go access to the website, both our EWGO and FAO. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Um, Before I sort of start wrapping up, Amit uh, Rajesh Shuri, anything you want to add to this discussion and your expectations as we move forward and also your plan as we move forward because I think everyone, Olafur knows us well and Scott knows us well and so does Peter and I know we will get to know Jinxia well as well. 
we are a bit of a dog with a bone. So once we pick up something, we don't give up on it. And uh, so we will continue this. But Amit and Rajeshwari, maybe Rajeshwari, would you like to go first? You've been listening very patiently to everyone discussing your report. So would you like to say anything and any points you would like to highlight? Um, I think, uh, firstly, thank you, Sumita, for allowing uh, me to put in my points. Uh, uh, when when Amit, myself, and Deepak, when we when we worked on this, Rajeshwari, little louder. Yeah. Yeah. So when we started work on this, I think uh, one of the main uh, ideas, what was in our mind, is to is to take the discussion out in the open. I mean, we've been hearing about it. Uh, it's a lot of work. I can tell you, comparing lists like that, uh, there are chances of errors and a lot of a lot of background uh, checks we need to do. Uh, but the idea is uh, that we raise this issue, we talk about it, and and we see what can be done. It's it's a very forward looking ideas that we had that uh, you know the discussion needs to now happen, uh, considering that uh, you know the. Similar discussions are happening in the GLG and even at the global platform. The statement was just put out. Um, yeah, that's the that's the spirit. Uh, you know, we all come together. It's the the fact that WHO, FAO, OIE, and GLG are sitting together and talking about it um, of, of of about the crucial issues. Uh, I think uh, we have started the discussion and it should not stop. That is something we would like to at least I would like to put forth. Yeah. Thank you, Rajeshwari. Very well said. Deepak, would you like to add something? I, <clears throat> I, I just want to agree with uh, Rajeshwari, like she said, that we all are on a similar platform and everybody is uh, talking what we have just put in our report. So yeah, it feels really good and this, uh, this discussion should not stop. This is important. Thank you, Deepak, and thank you for the work. Amit? Um, okay, so what to do next. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So clearly, I think we will. It's 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 good to know that uh, the problems, uh, the gaps that we have identified, and the possibilities that we have highlighted are well acknowledged. And there is, I can see a very positive vibe in terms of yes, there's a recognition of the problem, and this would this should be taken up further internally between uh, different organizations of the tripartite. I think that's a very encouraging sign and we will of course uh, take it up. Uh, we will keep uh, following it up based through our further work on this as well as engaging with the tripartite organizations. I just want to say one point that uh, it's, it's a very simple point that when we were trying to analyze these, I can tell you they were, they, one of course is there are three organizations and there are multiple documents of these three organizations. I really felt that nobody in, it's very difficult for anybody in the government to really scratch down to those fine lines and fine fine prints to be able to figure out what this document is saying. At times we had to we had to write to Olafur. In terms of are we interpreting it correctly? So imagine the the problem. Imagine the 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 the, the chances of misinterpretation, and keeping that in. I mean, it took us a lot of time. So for me. The ideal thing would have been just one page. Now, you, one document. Now you are a tripartite. Now it's no longer about individual organizations. Just give us that one page or one document and with same definitions, with same guidance, and that's it. And I'm very well appreciating and respecting the point of views around granularity and all those things. But still, there's a lot of it which is much beyond words. It is not only about wording. It is also about the concepts and the definitions. So I think a lot can be done even without really trying to over-regulate it at the ground level. Uh, it still will leave a lot of space for individual countries to decide what suits them best. So there's a lot that can be done by just arriving at a consensus between the tripartite organizations and just giving us that one document. That's it. Even the differences given. I mean, yes. what I'm basically saying is, Give us something, and I think it's a very important point, Amit, because again, Peter, all of four, Junsia, you know, we are concerned at the national level. We are all clear that it's the national action plan that is really that matters. Now, for the act, national action plan, they, we need that, uh, you know, that, that understanding and that capacity building that we've all talked about. But the capacity can only be built when there is clarity. And if there is no clarity, 
at the national level, they won't know. So yes, thank you, Amit. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. But I, I'm not leaving you, Amit, very quickly. What do you want to do next now? How do you plan to take this forward? So, so first, of course, this has to be discussed at the national level, Sunita, with, with all the three, sector, uh, three sectors that we have worked upon. So there would be series of workshops, series of meetings that I can envision right now. And I, I, I'm very encouraged by, by, the part, by the folks who have attended this discussion, I'm sure. These would be the folks who would determine how would things shape up in, in India. So I'm very happy and thank you to all folks who have joined us today. We will be reaching out to you for similar discussions for our, for our country and for individual sectors. That's one. Second, of course, we do feel that our learnings can, can also be used. Uh, used. Uh, for example, we got emails from some countries in Africa that they are now working on this list for animals. They are now working on this list for humans. And I think that is something where we should engage with, uh, with our pan-African nations. We do have our network there and we'll do a series of workshops there also. That's the plan. And then of course, we'll, we'll, we'll keep engaging with the tripartite organizations. And you're also working now on a further paper, Scott. We are working on a paper on what we are broadly calling intensive farming systems, uh, because we need to understand the anti antibiotic use and what can be done to actually minimize it. Because again, uh, we come from a part of the world, you have to understand all of our comes from an organization which is closest to our heart. Okay, and of course, I am not discounting FAO, but I mean, uh, as environmentalists, all of all, for us, livestock is critical. We believe in what we call an agro silvo pastoral system. And for Indians, we know that the role that livestock plays in the role in, in, in the life of an individual farmer in India is so critical. I mean, you have to please understand that we are one environmental organization which actually has never stood for vegetarianism, okay? Even if we are all vegetarians, because we know the role of, um, of, of animals in, in farmers' lives. But we also know that it's the health of uh, the environment, the health of, the, um, of humans, and ultimately the health of livestock that we are all working towards. And how do we make sure we can get that uh, to happen? So I, I'm going to wrap up because we are out of time and I, um, but we are right on time actually. And I have to therefore thank all of you for this amazing um, interventions and for helping us to understand that uh, we, are, we are all together on this. And uh, I also want to thank uh, the number of people both who have joined us and the point and the um, issues that you have raised. For many of you, I just want to say, I hope please be patient with us. Our next meeting is going to be to look at this and the Indian context. And we are also going to be doing, Amit, am I right? Meetings on poultry, on dairy. You will do sector specific meetings as well. And that's where the issue both of animal practice as well as the alternatives comes in. That's where the question of uh, the guidance at the more granular level will come in. So please, um, uh, you know, the points that you have raised, each one is very important and we will, we will definitely see these more carefully and work on them and see how can we move this discussion forward. But I, I have to thank everyone once again and also to, to, to say that uh, uh, Peter, Olafur, Jungsia, and of course Scott is a colleague, but uh, to the three of you, uh, we will engage with you whether you like it or not. Okay, so we are planning to be with you and on this uh, with you for some time. And I hope we will, you will bear with us. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amit, Rajeshwari and Deepak for this excellent work. And thank you, Scott, for all the guidance and wisdom that you bring to this conversation because uh, you really help us and particularly at GLG to see how do we steer through this, uh, um, this issue, which is, which is complicated. And it involves the life of people and the livelihoods of people and very poor people. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita, for this excellent meeting. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.